Welcome to our Squiz podcast, G. Thanks for having me, May. I'm very excited to be here. So with us today is G Moon, the CMO at Nuix. G, you and I actually have known each other for a while. I won't say how long. No, no don't. Exactly. No one needs to know that. <laughs> You're really young looking. But I've always found your personal and career journey like such a fascinating one because it's just so diverse and so interesting. So I simply had to get you on this podcast the moment the opportunity came up. So thank you for accepting. I am privileged to be asked. And likewise, your career trajectory, we have lots in common. Do so yeah, it should be a good discussion. We do. So many of our listeners will be able to take great inspiration and insights into their own path from our chat today. So without further ado, let's get cracking and take a squeeze or a closer look at your journey. So... Gee, let's just start off with the simple questions. Tell me about you, G, the person, and then end with a pit stop tour of your career. So uh, as a um, human, I came into the world in Korea, in Seoul, but I lived there only two years of my life. And then my parents moved to Malaysia for their, or for my father's work. I grew up as an expat in Malaysia, and then I spent my childhood there my middle and high school years in Singapore at a boarding school there and then to the US for university at my first job and then yeah through Europe before coming here 18 years ago with my Dutch husband and then we had three Australian kids and what was supposed to be a one-year secondment to Australia has turned into this, which is the typical Australian story. You and I are like the United Nations with my American husband and quasi-American kids and everybody's mashed up together, right? So that's right. What, what about your career or your current role right now at Nuix? Tell us a little bit about that and Nuix as well. Yeah, Nuix is a super exciting tech company at a really a big pivot point in its history. Um, it is a data specialist that sort of helps large organizations take huge amounts of data and just understand it to be able to protect it, to govern it, and then like really leverage it as well. So the role that I have within that is, the title is obviously Chief Marketing Officer, but the role really was to help the company set a vision for its future and create and project the the future that we wanted to have and try to bring that forward. It's been a blast. It's been just two years, but it feels two lifetimes. And yeah, I'm having a great time. We'll delve into how you did your transition from your last role into this one, which will be another interesting conversation. But yes, so much to dig into. But before we do that, one last kind of angle around you as G. Often we have the two sides to us, like mm -hmm. the one that the family and the friends see. And I've mm -hmm. seen that, which is lovely. On the other side is the boss woman, the C-sweeter in the, the organization. What would either party say about you? I probably would get pretty much the same response from both sides, especially if you ask my family, who would be, as you would expect, brutally honest, I'm the more, I'm actually more the boss lady at home than I am at work. <laughs> and then probably equally disrespected on both sides from the front door. Um, yeah, I think both at home and at work in my nature, and then also because of circumstances, I'm organized. So I just plan and prepare things like a small thing is like on a Sunday, I'll cook for the whole week. Um, I still and still can't believe you I, do that. That is crazy I to me. I still do that. Yeah. And that's just thing, a way that I feel I've got to run my life in order to, to keep head above water. Generosity is a really important value for me. I value it in others. And then I also try to reflect that not just in like in, in money terms, but more in terms of time and, and giving back. And so that's why things like this opportunity is something that I, I jumped at. And then, yeah, I, a big way in which I like to have fun is to have people at, in my home and around the dinner table. That is my happy place is a full dinner table. And so I hope that friends would say that I'm a good host, but 
Trust me, I can attest to that very much. She also does put you on your heels because then you realize what entertaining at home really should look like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it's an inspiration to the rest of us who get to benefit from that. That's but so nice. Last thing on ins inspiration, since we're on that. Have you come up to being this type of person because you were inspired by somebody or are there any inspirational figures in your life that kind of help you be who you are now? No, I've, I can't put, pull it down to one person. There's just different. Yeah, I'm inspired by lots of people and I try to like always look at I, I call it their superpower and every boss that I've had, I try and look at, okay, what is their superpower and yeah. what can I learn from that? And yeah, there's things in my, I guess my first bosses, my parents and yeah. my dad's a, yeah, a super driven. And so I get, I admire and try and emulate that. My mom's really warm and yeah, the sort of opening up the home side of things is very much from her and then other bosses. I've just, there's been people who I've never seen uh, who are just unflappable and I really admire and try and emulate that. Or someone who's really taught me that you can choose what to be stressed about and what not to. And that was like a revelation to me. So yeah, I agree with that, the different sources of inspiration. I love that. Hmm. So let's transition to your meaty career. I call it really meaty because it's very meaty. So you started off, even though you look like you're 28, you started off in the dot-com boom in San Francisco near Silicon Valley, and you started off in advertising. And then you've had a really interesting career across US, Europe, Middle East, Asia, Pac. Can you tell us a little bit about the diversity of maybe your more recent leadership type roles in the last, let's say, 15 years or so? Because I think it's really interesting to, for people to hear the type of sectors and roles that you took in different countries. Yeah, no, I'm very happy to. And I don't know that it's meaty, but it's, it is diverse. And it's, therefore, it takes a little while to run through, but I'll do my best at a <laughs> little stop tour. So I studied diplomacy and in international relations and diplomacy in university, which had absolutely nothing to do with so your parents love that one. <laughs> my job, yeah. I worked in, as you say, advertising in, in San Francisco as my first job. And then I moved client side at Canon Europe, Canon's European headquarters in Amsterdam. And then Canon moved me to London, where I worked with them for a while. And then I left to go do my MBA and then started work at, I got onto the graduate program at Dell. And so I did that. And then an opportunity came up at Vodafone, Telco. So I thought, I've done Telco before. That would be interesting. So I went there. And they're the ones who moved me actually to Australia. So I came here with them in, yeah, I say 18 years ago. And they, yeah, then an opportunity came up in banking. So I was at Westpac for four, four and a half, nearly five years and had a great time there. Um, then I got to a point where I think I, I got a little bit bored and, and wanted to break out of the corporate and test myself in an environment that would have been much smaller and it worked at a different pace. And so an opportunity came up at Best and Less, which was at the time really struggling against a backdrop of Kmart taking off and the other similar discount retailers really picking up their game. And so I got connected to a the new CEO at the time and I just connected with her and for the first time in my life, chose a job for the person, not the brand. Mm -hmm. And then I've never looked back on that since. I had an opportunity to do another turnaround at OPSM, which was, took me into the kind of care world as well as retail. And then I was at, I left that to take up an opportunity at American Express. And so I had a regional role in that I was and head of marketing for the merchant side of the business for Asia Pack. That was, it was an amazing environment. I learned so much about building a culture in that organization, but I, the second time around back in the corporate world, I realized it's not me. I thrive uh, in, I, I need a little bit more chaos. Yeah. I think if you've got that 
sort of thing, your happiest organizing things, you need things to be slightly disorganized. <laughs> like so that. yeah, I, I had this opportunity come up and I embraced it and I, I not looked back. Here you are in tech now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, from advertising to consumer durables to IT hardware, telco, banking, different forms of retail and then and tech. And so my running commentary on that is that I've never been invited to the same sector twice. So (laughs) So you're running out of sectors, I think. (laughs) If there is a next step eventually in 10 years, you're going to run out soon. Yeah. No one can say that was in Meaty. So I was right. I think you were wrong on that front. (laughs) Yeah. Look, the one consistency in it is obviously marketing. And I am a self-professed one-trick pony. That is what I know, that what is what I love. And I, yeah, I keep it interesting for myself by the change in sector for a while, change in geography as well. And I try to use that newness as an advantage rather than a a disadvantage. So a lot of times they'll say, oh, you have no experience in tech or you have no experience in banking. But yeah, I look for ways in which actually that can be a benefit to the organization rather than a, a drawback for myself. I think that's a fascinating angle for us to explore more on because there are a lot of people that I speak to still ask for my advice or or my perspective. I myself have also moved through a lot of sectors and people always go, particularly when you're in a senior role Mm -hmm. or you want to move to a more senior role, right? Think head off, director, VP, C-suite. And you can still get pegged in, you have sector experience in this area you don't have enough to bring it over into this new sector, particularly if you're taking on a senior role. What is your view on that? Like, how would you, how would, how have you, or maybe what would you advise those who are trying to break into another sector, but are facing this objection? Yeah. I mean, um, I personally would, would think that if they're not open to thinking more broadly, then that's probably not the right organization for Mm -hmm. me in the sense that also what I like to work on is is be in is is change, right? Which is evidenced by the kind of changes that I've looked for in, in my career, but that's also what I think I can bring to the table. And so if the thinking is that actually we need someone who can just keep things as it was and and stick to the rules of the the category or the industry, then I'm not the right person. Yeah. I think, yeah, I look at that as a mutual selection process. I realize that that also implies that you've always got lots of choice and lots of options, which isn't the case, right? Then I, what I tend to do is try to show examples of where different thinking has brought about a benefit for organizations. Mm -hmm thinking in, for instance, in banking, as we were looking at redesigning branches and rather than taking inspiration from what the newest branch at the next competitor looked like, actually looking at how you design successful spaces that people meet in and congregate in and taking inspiration for things like Grand Central Station as much as Mm -hmm. bank Um, and then uh, looking at the um, flooring surface in Mm -hmm. that and how you bring that into a branch to create ambient noise that gives you privacy mm. to be able to have um, conversations in the sort of open public space rather than everything happening behind closed meeting room doors and therefore making the branch look dead. Examples like that. Um, also, um, newness, um, if I were to, and, and I do, uh, build my team, it, you want a balance of people You've got the history and the the knowledge, but then also a balance of fresh thinking and someone who can challenge the mm. invention. And there's so, something really healthy in being able to just have someone ask the obvious questions like, oh, but why is it done in this way? Yeah. Why is it called that? To force you to actually reflect and rethink. And so that's the role that I offer to play and do play on leadership teams is to ask those questions. I I completely agree with you around getting into a culture that actually embraces that diversity and embraces being challenged, particularly if they're in a transformation 
a lot of the roles, most of the roles that you've been in have been in transformation, similar to me, right? Mm. There's something to turn around. And if they're not looking to adapt and to embrace a different perspective, then why are you going mm. there in the first place? Um, so on that, coming back to those choices that you made, what were the personal, what were your considerations? You, you're, you're, you have a busy family, you're very hands-on, you're equally as hands-on in very senior roles with large remits. When you make one shift to another, something is traded off like inevitably. How do you make those decisions for yourself from a professional side and also from a personal side? What do you consider? In terms of the trade-offs? Um, in terms of what's more important to you and what are you willing to trade off on the professional front or the personal front, depending on the role that you want to take? What are those consideration factors that tend to be important for you when you're making a shift? Yeah, I think those things change over time. So in the early part of my career, the brand that I'd be able to put on the seat mattered a lot because I wanted the geographic mobility and so I, I wanted brands that would be recognized from one geography to another um so the the trade-off for that I guess would have been perhaps could have had more exciting or more money at another organization but at a smaller organization say but at that time what well, that wasn't as valuable to me as the brand on the cv so I was reasonably intentional about that. Mm. And then, as I say, there was a point where actually that didn't matter as much. And what mattered more was who I was going to be working with and surrounding myself with. That has become the most important factor. And then I'll trade off on the brand and the, the, uh, and I'm very comfortable to trade off some of the glitz and glamour of corporate for, yeah, for kind of things that matter to me more now, which is the amount of the level of impact I can have. And, and then on the home front, yes, certain things like the sitting down to dinner as a family every night matters a lot, which means that I then trade off a little bit of the weekend time to make that possible. I also, when they say that it, you, it takes a village to raise a child, I, I had to pay for that village. And so <laughs> that's also a trade-off as well. So yeah, so I think it, it you make your choices intentionally, but then also those choices change over time. And I think that's really... That's practical advice because a lot of a lot of people that must speak to you speak to me about what do I do about do I lean in, lean out? I'm starting a family. I have a young family. What do I do to not jeopardize the future career that I've got? And the advice you've given here is really practical because at every single point, you're going to have different things that you're willing to trade off. And to be honest, like most of us will end up working for a very long time. Um, the whole thought of retiring at 50 or 55 was wonderful many a moons ago, no pun intended. <laughs> but now I think this partly is because you have to work, partly it's because you want to work. Mm -hmm. So just because you make a choice somewhere in your 20s or 30s or even your 40s doesn't define your future. Um, so I think it's okay to take a few risks, but make a calculated calculation or, or risk on each move, but then know that it's not the end all. Yeah, you... no, that's right. A friend of mine, a very astute friend of mine says, life is short, but careers are long. Mm -hmm. And I feel yeah. that really resonates with me because I get bored quite easily. Yes. Like even cycling something twice is, I think, okay, right now, what am I going to do to not drive myself batty and keep it still interesting? And so if you think about that, then in yeah. that, then yeah, careers are long. And yeah, thinking about and being intentional about how you keep things interesting, how you put your hand up for more, how you push yourself, give yourself a hard shove out of the comfort zone and into things that feel less familiar. There are, I think, all ways in which to keep it alive for you and for me, give me a sense of being alive. Like I always say, the edge of the seat 
is where I do my best work. Is <laughs> I'm there's a really fine line between falling and 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 accelerating, and that's yeah, that's a really fun place to be. So. On the note around being on the edge of falling and making intentional moves, you did an MBA at Cambridge. Many people ask you around, is an MBA the way you still get a leg up in your career these days? What's your point of view? Yeah, I, I get that question a lot. And I am, um, I, it was for me. So I think coming out of, um, the job before and the job after my salary as an example doubled but it was because I did it at a very specific time in my career like it's mm. not hard to double not a lot and yeah I was 26 or 27 when I did it which is the recommended four years after your undergraduate degree um and yeah so for me it had that impact and it had that impact also because I went into an American organization and in certain cultures, the MBA is valued more than in others. So definitely in the American culture, for instance, whereas I think in Australia coming here, like, I don't even know if it's still on my CV or not. Like it's not, mm. it's mm. not really valued or relevant. It's never a requirement on a role. And so my answer to that question, which is, sounds like a get out is it depends, right? Mm. It depends on your, like where you are in your career. There is a point where it can make a difference. And there's a point where like, you, it, if you want to do it for yourself, definitely do it. But it's, it, there's a point in your career where I don't think it makes a difference. And it's also the same with sort of cultures as well. So you say a point in your career, do, do you mean slightly earlier on yes. in the first path of your career that's yes. more important versus later on yes in the first in the early the earlier you do it almost the more of an impact it can have in terms of things like your pay and getting you in from say the undergraduate graduate program to the MBA version of it so there's yeah it, it, it can make a difference then but honestly I did the MBA because I wanted to um fell into marketing. It wasn't what I studied. It wasn't any, anything that I was really intentional about. And I just wanted to understand what does the rest of this oh, of a company do? What happens in supply chain management or in, 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 in finance? That was, I, I went in mostly for that curiosity. And then it was a bonus that it actually helped from a remuneration perspective mm. as well. Love, love that insight. I think many people will find that interesting. Let's go into a specific part of the work life. So you've taken on a lot of exec roles that have been charged with business turnarounds and you successfully return them to profitability and growth. Those are notoriously hard roles. Those are notoriously risky roles. What attracts you to those roles? I think exactly those things. That yeah. it's hard and that it's, challenging and meaty to use your words that and that yeah and that there's an element of risk that's that kind of edge of the chair phenomenon and also that the other thing is there is a certain liberation that comes in with those businesses where there the case for change is really strong whatever you try is like really probably not going to send it backwards and so at the very least, you'll stay still. It won't yes. bring you forward, but you'll get a learning out of that. And you take the next move and hopefully that uh, puts you forward. Yeah, there's a freedom that comes with it. There's a pace and an intensity that I love. And then, yeah, there's also that edge of the chair type of risk that comes with it. And yeah, there's been times when it's not quite worked out in the way that mm. we'd wanted. So the best and less, as an example, was when it started improving and then like acquisitions started it was acquired and so that was an unexpected turn and so mm. these things yeah do happen but if you're in it for the whole thing and actually that just adds to the excitement then it's it's like a drug and I'm hooked <laughs> so on that note what is what are the typical characteristics that would make that a great drug and not a exhausting drain for some like who is this type of role 
perfect for? What kind of characteristics would should they have that would help them thrive? I think um, I always say that you're successful if your what you want out of it is mapped with what the organization needs out of it. I think someone who wants to grow and wants is in a hurry to get somewhere is the right person for an environment like this because mm. they've got skin in the game. The sooner they can drive that forward, the, the sort of more it drives them and their individual career forward. Being naturally driven helps you align with a company like that. Just energy, yeah, to some degree, organization and just being able to manage lots of things all at the same time. And then I think someone who um, just gets energy from other people it's a it, it, you form storm and norm really quickly in this type of um, an environment and being someone who thrives off of that group sense and yeah wants to contribute to that as much as the sort of pure business it's, uh, metrics itself I think it's what would make you successful in in an environment like this yeah I, I've similarly found that to be the case too like where you instead of being drained by having to juggle literally hundreds of balls at the same time where everything is urgent and your team needs you and your C-suite peers need you and external customers need you and being able to find clarity in that noise and do it really quickly with urgency. For those, that's not the perfect place for. You quickly decide that you're either not going to thrive there and you should probably pick something else because it, it is exhausting, right? Let's know two ways around it. 100%. And I know very explicit about that when I'm interviewing is that this is not the right place for everyone. In fact, if anything, it's probably it's more unsuitable for most people than it is sure. for those. But yeah, for those who exactly as you say, you articulate it really well. If you the, almost the busier you are, the more energetic you get, then this is totally the right environment. So you've been in lots of these and part of what is valuable for our listeners is everybody's going to make tremendous mistakes mm -hmm. and the bigger the transformation, the more mistakes, but through that you learn. What is one example that you feel that you could share around a really tough transformation that you tackled and the learnings that you've gained from those? Yeah, I think my lesson was around leadership and in leading a, a, a transformation, it also impacts on the people that you've got in the team. Lots of people self-select out, as we've just said. It's not the, the, the right kind of mode and environment for everybody. But also, you have to make sometimes some hard choices as a leader. And, and that's a, a kind of a delicate point in a team's journey through that where you have destabilized the team as it was and there are now fewer people holding it up before you rebuild again to something that's sort of fit for that purpose. And in going, one, one experience early on in going through that, that's quite a scary point and I needed to just be really cliche words but like open and, and honest about that and as opposed to my natural, at the time, my natural sort of inclination was to say, it's all good. Everything's going to be great. When actually it wasn't. My leader at the time, I had to bring the team together and explain this. And I prepared what I was going to say. And I had her read it. And she said to me, this is too polished. You need to be more authentic and more vulnerable about it. And I was like, oh, I don't... I don't know how. What do you mean? What are the words? Because I had grown up with in an era and um, with a view that the leader always held it together and uh, he always has the answers and doesn't show fear. And so to unlearn that was something that I couldn't do at that time and took me actually a couple of years to even realize what that could look like for me. And it was only actually in COVID and leading a different team in a different organization through COVID when none of us knew what this thing was, what when we were going to be out of it, which way was up, 
And I, as someone who, yeah, it, like the classic uh, definition of an extrovert of getting energy from people, I've really struggled with the whole work from home setup. And then I was supposed to lead lots of people through this transition and tell everyone it was okay, going to be okay when I didn't know it, I was okay. And because I had the, the emotions I felt were so strong and I couldn't not share it, I did. And then the response I got back made me realize, oh, that's what she meant when she said, be more, you need to be more authentic and more vulnerable. And so I don't know if that was a mistake as such as what you were, what, what you were um, asking in your question, but that is a, certainly a big learning. And it's one that literally the space between when I was asked to do it and when I did do it was a couple of years but it was a super valuable one for me. That's probably the most interesting response I've had to one of those type of questions. Mm. Um, appreciate that, particularly because people always think it's the work, it's the process, it's the tech, it's the something. And even more so recognizing that transformation in yourself to lead a transformation effectively can take years for it to just click. It's unlearning decades. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Which yeah. kind of is an analogy for business today. Like we've done, we've operated the same way for decades. And now, particularly with AI and how it's changing everything, you almost have to like, how do you turn on and switch to something completely different in months, which a lot of people are struggling with. So I think this is, it's, that was a nice story to, to kind of reflect on. The whole point of this podcast is to take a closer look and allow you to come as you are. So let's talk about the whole you. You're not just an incredible senior executive with a crazy schedule and transformative career. You are also, more importantly, a parent mm -hmm. of three. <laughs> not one, not two, but three. With no extended family support around you. Um, people talk about this kind of, the struggle is real. And it can be for any parent. Right. Has that been a really tangible part of your career that you've had to intentionally navigate through and manage? Yes and no, I'd say. Am I busy? Am I having to make sacrifices? Am I missing things? Am I feeling like I'm not doing either job? Yes to all of the above. But I've never really thought about it as a juggle. And I don't mean to take anything away from just how difficult it is. But yeah, I've never really related to it as a juggle because I relate to it more as a choice that I make. I want both of these things in my life. And late at night, and as I'm tucking in and uh, kids are asking me when they were younger, oh, why do you have to go away? Or why do you have to do this? Or why do you have to be at work? Yeah, my response has always been like, but that... That that's what I choose to do. You choose to do these things for yourself. And this is what I do for myself. And so that's always been my relationship. I've also been super lucky with my husband and his career choice. And he's an academic. And so he has much more uh, flexibility over his schedule than a typical sort of corporate person would. And we've also, as I said, been choiceful about what people would spend on a holiday. We spend on support and helpers around us. Yeah, I think it's, um, yes, there's balancing and all of that. But I don't, yeah, I don't really relate to it as a juggle because for me, it feels more like a choice. And also, I don't feel a lot of guilt around it because I, I genuinely believe I'm a better parent for having something else in my life and the older they get the more they agree with me yes like it would be good if you could go away again yeah and yeah so my answer might not be as typical or, or necessarily helpful no i'm actually in the same vein like i started a business two months into my maternity with my oh, son oh. because i just felt like i was my brain needed something more and that made me less annoyed with myself and i think it made me more patient to have something. So I completely get where you are. And there were moments of the kids going, why are you always on the computer? Why are you always in calls, etc." But to your point, we intentionally decide the important things that we should turn up for, that we need to be present for. Yeah. Dinner every night, specific performance, going away together. 
And I think we, like, I've just come to realize that my kids are a lot more resilient than I think that we probably gave them credit for. And, you know, your girls are the same, probably getting to that teenage years and preteen similarly. And when I hear my own kids start to talk about where they want to take their career and I want to do better than you and et cetera, et cetera. That's pretty, I, I suppose they take something away from watching you navigate your own career. Yeah, that's awesome. Yes, that's all you can hope for. So what are one of those profound things that your uh, kids might have said to you about watching you navigate your own career? Do you think that, what are the things that you think they take away from that, watching you make those choices, as you said? Yeah, I can tell you as a parent of three teenagers that there has been nothing that they say to me that makes me feel good, but they, the no. way in which they are right, and the things that I observe leave me um, in awe, just the drive, the, the sort of level of effort that they'll put in and then the, the joy and satisfaction they get when they get the results and the fearlessness that they have about hard work and mm. yeah so I uh, yeah it's definitely not in, in, nothing profound or positive that they say but it's in their behavior I observe things that make me think okay I haven't done a bad job I didn't totally screw it up yeah <laughs> and what in this generation have you taken away from observing them that you think that's something useful for me to take away I think it is that fearlessness mm. that mm. I spoke of but as I think about it now out loud, I don't know if it's a generational thing or if it's just that mm. age. If I look back at myself and like some of the moves I made, I think I'd be a lot more anxious about it now and really trying to weigh up everything. Whereas I just, someone asked me to move to Australia for a year, like they need help. Can you go and do it? And I'd been here one time. We had not recently gotten married. I was 20 weeks pregnant at wow. the time. And I just said, yeah, sure. Why not? So yeah, no fear. And I think that window is, is not open forever in our minds. So I think at that stage in your career, like you should definitely put your hand up, t take every opportunity and just go for it because the choices feel a lot heavier when you're more responsibility, kids, mortgages and all that. So yeah. I love that. So take a closer look. This podcast is about getting under the hood of how leaders like you become who you are and how you earned the right to be there. You've had a very distinctly unique, diverse, interesting, rewarding career. If somebody were to want to follow this pathway and this journey, what would your kind of top insights or advice be to that person? Oh God, I would say say be open and take every opportunity don't overthink it yeah I th when they say it was luck or it was the right place at the time I think you make your own luck um and it's also just about seizing things as well there's probably lots of opportunity circling around all of us at any given time but it's about which ones you just go and grab with both hands so yeah I would say it being about being just embracing that and and embracing change that's actually one of our pillars embracing change so on that note g thank you so much this has been around the world and back an amazing conversation and only someone like you with your experience could share so thank you thank you for, on behalf of our listeners thank you may it's been just special to have this time with you and and a different way for Absolutely. you and I to connect. <laughs>